All right. Sorry, me again. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, we've got a, we've got a panel today to um, um, talk a little bit more about about wastewater and, and, and a bit more broadly about one water um, concepts. Um, we're fortunate to have this talented panel with us. Um, we have uh, um, a, a, say a technology developer here. We've got a practitioner. Um, we've got a thinker on water and wastewater and a thinker on, on one water. I don't want to oversimplify that, you know, because all these folks are thinking about water all the time and, and, uh, and, and they're also implementing um, and, and programs and implementing um, thoughts about water for the future. Um, so I want to first just introduce the panel. We've got uh, Tyler Hjorth um, here with San Marcos Water. Um, he's uh, got a lot of experience. He's worked in electric generation. He's managed utilities at College Station, and he's been here managing utilities at uh, San Marcos for the last 5.5 years. Um, we've also got Michael Murphy with us. Um, he's uh, currently associated with the New England Water Environment Association, um, but he's he's new to Austin. But he grew new recently to Austin. But he grew up in Austin, so. Um, um, so in that sense, he's not new. Um, he's been focused a lot on water innovation and in, innovation for Massachusetts. Um, so he'll kind of help bring a um, maybe a non-Texan perspective, um, which is always good to hear what other folks are doing as well. We've got uh, Danny Bogar with uh, 374 Water, um, and he's uh, head of operations for them and also a lecturer here at Texas State in the School of Business. Um, so that's our panel, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, good grief! How did I skip you? I was thinking, I was thinking, I missed somebody. Oh yeah, you're not there. And we've got Jenna, <laughs> no um, who uh, yeah, my little my question got dropped off there. I'll have to go get my computer. Um, Jenna works at the Meta Center for Water um, and the Environment. Mm -hmm. um, she's the director of Watershed Services, and. Um, um, and she has done a lot of work on, on One Water, has a lot of interest in, in One Water, has been involved in um, One Water issues in the Hill Country, among a number, number of other things. And then in her past, um, you're a lic licensed water and wastewater operator um, and uh, um, work with Waco in that role. Um, also has experience on the policy side, um, working for one of the uh, uh, state senators. Um, I'm going to go grab my laptop real quick. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of digital and being uh, relying on technology. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with, uh, with Danny and um, on the technology side and then, uh, um, and then kind of move towards more broadly to start us off. But um, there's a, uh, uh, I read an article recently where um, PFAS, which I always forget, PFAS is what polyfluoride. No, you made a line. What is it? You said PFAS. That's all I know. Okay, <laughs> it's not good. Um, bad, bad stuff. There we go. There we Thank go. Thank you. Um, that uh, um, it's detected in all the rain, pretty much all the rainfall on the planet, except for parts of the Himalayas and Antarctica at levels that aren't considered safe by um, United Nations. And so, and it's uh, um, thought to be cancer causing. Um, and, uh, and so that's that's um, likely to be something that we're gonna see regulations on in the future. And I know you've, you've developed the technology to uh, hit it with the, uh, the hammer there. Um, tell, tell us about your, uh, your technology, it's AIR SCWO. Yeah, so, um, what what we do is we have a reactor. It's called supercritical water oxidation. And our version of supercritical water oxidation is uh, is oxidized with air. So we call it air squo. And just, you know, to finish the commercial, I had to bring my hammer because my, my name of my company was wrong. On <laughs> who are you, you going to hit? Andres, I want you to hit Andres. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> But anyway, and then we also we we listed on Nasdaq last summer, and that's our tickler symbol. So that's the whole commercial. But bottom line is, what our technology does it through heat and pressure. It you process 
any sludge through it, anything organic goes through our system and it breaks it down to its basic element. And if, you know, the poly, whatever, whatever, the PFAS chemicals, the the uh, pharmaceuticals, the uh, microplastic, these are all organic, you know, they're all carbon-based. And so anything carbon-based that goes through our system is broken down to its basic elements, which is mostly water, a little bit of mineral salts, a little bit of uh, carbon dioxide, and and so basically eliminates waste. Our technology eliminates waste. So our first customer is a giant wastewater treatment plant, Orange County Sanitation. Um, and Orange County is a, is a early adopter. They're an innovator. And basically they bought our system to eliminate sludge. Um, and the cost, when you go to the left coast, in the right coast of the United States, the cost of getting rid of sludge is going up, up, up because of the PFAS, because of the microplastics, because of pharmaceuticals, et cetera. So that's that's basically what our system okay. does. So are you, are you saying that PFAS is no longer a forever for, forever chemical? If it goes through our system, okay. it's destroyed. It's destroyed. It's Can't destroyed. That, that, that is good to know. Yeah, if you don't know, PFAS is called a forever chemical because it, it hangs out in the natural environment forever um so mo moving on to the the practitioner um you know the ultimately cities water providers are the ones got to make sure when people turn on the faucet they're getting reliable safe drinking water and uh and so so you guys need you guys need stuff that works um i was at a um kind of a water think tank up in wisconsin and uh, everybody introduced themselves and and there was a guy there representing water utilities, and he goes, "Yeah, we have a unofficial slogan: me second, um, because <laughs> they're, you know, they want somebody else to try the new technology first. Um, so I'm just kind of, kind of curious, um, Tyler, like, like with uh, San Marcos Water, um, what are your current capabilities, and what are your plans for the future, and, and how do you think about like employing new technology?" Yeah, that, that's a. Good question, Robert. Um, second first is, uh, you know, that's considered a best industry practice for most people that are governmental, municipal people, right? Uh, you know, we, we don't have any margin for error. We don't have an opportunity for disappointing, you know, in stock dividends or end of year bonuses, right? So we, we've got one service, one product, um, and we have to do it and do it well. So typically you'll find that uh, uh, we all, you know, we'll, we'll look at you know, beyond conventional treatment, uh, maybe get into some membrane stuff, you know, we'll do some different things. But at the end of the day, to your uh, point during your uh, conversation right before this one, um, is uh, at some point, there's only so many water molecules. There's only so many water rights in Texas, and they're all bought up. And so everybody that's turning in that 50-year plan to the state, at some point is going to have reuse of pinpoint for reuse it's not an option they, they, sing it brother right, right. <laughs> there, there has to be there's got to be another solution because we're not going to create more water um so the second uh you know being the, being the second customer uh it's it's been a, a standard practice forever nobody wants to be the one that goes out there and stubs their toe uh, but the reality of it is we don't have a choice but to face these things and and it's sooner rather than later san marcus uh, we turned in our 50-year projection in july uh, it was accepted by Regionale, uh, and I think we're better off than most. We're out there in the um, 35, 40, 45 year range before we start getting pinched, uh, which is, uh, and that's an honest assessment. Uh, population growth isn't quite as crazy as what's projected. Uh, we can we can hit 45, 50 years, um, but there's nothing left after that. So e even if you're not faced with I'm three years, five years, seven years out. Uh, all of us, you know, our obligation is to be looking at this at 50 years and everybody understands you have to have some new technology, new tools, new approaches. Robert, can I ask Yo, a question? Please, please. Tyler, this is really interesting to hear you talk about a utility having to face um, adopting new technology, right? Because in reuse may be one of them um, or will be one of them. How do you think about the risk that your utility will have to take on and and is that something that you see as you'll be able to share with the community 
with other entities, private sector, investor class? Yeah, actually, um, well, so my second first uh, part of my personality is, is we're actually hoping that some of the private folks uh, will take some of that on for us. And when I say private, I don't mean, um, you know, non-municipal utility providers. I'm talking about things like um, all your chemical plants, all your big process plants, all of them have to have water treatment systems as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little less risk averse than what we have to be. So we're hoping that, you know, to see some industrial folks uh, also help advance this cause. Mm -hmm. um, for them, it's a bottom line issue, but they all answer the TCEQ just like I do, right? Uh, so these have to be solid investments. They have to be solid processes. Uh, you know, we're all innovators and problem solvers. Uh, but uh, at the at the end of the day, San Marcos has currently has one wastewater treatment plant. We're in the plans for a second. There's no upset factor there. I mean, there's there's one, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if one is supposed to be direct potable, it's got to be 100 percent on. Right. Right? right. I mean, Robert, you mentioned you know mm -hmm. last hour the the risk of not doing that correctly is actually people dying. And so when you've only got one plant, uh, or if you're not able to blend it, well, you know, for us, we wouldn't be dumping that back into uh, a reservoir. Uh, right now, we discharge to the San Marcos River. But if we were going, uh, you know, potable reuse or uh, even an increased amount of, of reuse over what we have today, uh, yeah, it's got to be spot on. And for the record, I trust Tyler with the direct potable reuse. Uh, Robert lives in Austin. Did y'all have that <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the last <laughs> Um, I'm, not, I'm not forgetting about you. No, you go to Michael. Michael next. <laughs> I've got you in here now. Um, so, so there was a question uh, um, after the previous presentation I gave about um, AMI, um, Advanced Metering Infrastructure, um, which is kind of part of the smart water um, solution. Um, so, so I'm wondering, you know, what, what's your view on how smart water um, solutions can can help utilities in the water and wastewater world? Well, I personally love it. Um, Robert mentioned I'm from Austin. I just moved back uh, to Austin a few months ago. And the house we moved into had a broken irrigation system. I didn't know that until I got an email from Austin Water. Um, I should have seen the really nice green grass in the backyard <laughs> in the middle of a drought, but had a lot of other things I was thinking about in the move. Um, I immediately turned it off. So I love it. It's, it saved me some money now, right? I didn't need to have a broken irrigation system. And I you know, it was good to get the email from Austin Water. Um, you know, I also building on that, I think it helps um, users with their behavior. It gives them visualized, actionable information. Uh, that's not something we really had before. Um, I love it. I think a lot of people love to see what's going on uh, with their water. It helps them make changes to how they use water. Um, smart water is also going to uh, help utilities think about how they're communicating with one another um, and, you know, opening those lines of communication, being more connected, um, that will create higher levels of effectiveness and efficiency. I also see a workforce development component here. Um, I think we, we know that in the water sector and the utility sector on the, on the water side and wastewater side, we have a bit of a, a problem with workforce and attracting new talent. Um, it certainly was the case in New England. I understand this to be the case throughout. So I think a, a transition to, um, you know, digital tools and smart water will begin to attract more people to the sector because we're, we need it now. We're going to need it in the future. So those are a few things where I feel like smart water can really benefit the water and wastewater utility sector. Yeah, that's a, that's a good perspective because there's been, um, uh, you know, some studies in Texas that show we're, we're really struggling with having um, folks that that can run the water and wastewater. Um, and I can't remember there was a bill that was reducing the education requirements. Mm -hmm. um, I think you no longer had to have a high school diploma to run a water and wastewater plant. And uh, some some people turn that it's like, well, we're going to have high school kids running the plants. And yeah. now that's not what that means. But but um, um, there's a real struggle, particularly in rural areas. Right. Um, well, these are great jobs. I mean, they, they're in critical mm -hmm. jobs. And so if we can attract folks to the industry and expedite that training, I think we're doing all of our all of ourselves a favor. Cool, cool. So so Jenna, um, you know, you're involved with the One Water movement. 
um, which is, uh, you know, again, it's like the um, using the built environment as a source of supply, whether that's that's rainwater, condensate, stormwater, the black water. I mean, really anything that generates water on site, you know, can that be used? Um, how, how does uh, how does reuse fit into that one water movement? It's just seen more as a resource than what is the traditional approach of just getting that water off site and downstream as quickly and least less expensive as as possible. So um looking at at one water through that lens is more of a holistic approach. And you know, like Michael was saying, there we're having this blue wave. When I worked at the utility in Waco, we I always heard it was a blue wave where there's so many people retiring and, and we're losing that, that knowledge. But I see this as an opportunity to get more young people involved and see the transition of it's, it's going to take a bit, a paradigm dime shift where it's, it's not just, you know, the, the poop water we're using anymore <laughs> or newly. But also thinking about, um, you know, these forever chemicals, uh, the so many things that we don't even know about, like industry. I've I've always heard that they're very tight lipped about what what is in their wastewater, and they don't want to share that information. So I'm really interested to to see how that plays out too with um, with the private sector getting on board needing to share that information if it's if it's going to be impacting more and more folks um, in this cyclical environment. So so really just seeing um, all of these different types of water as as resources that can be utilized and recycled within our our environment and especially for the smaller communities that don't have a lot of op other options, it's going to have to be more and more um, a, a bigger consideration moving forward. What are the what are the concerns about um, discharging treated wastewater to hill country streams? Well, for the Texas hill country, a lot of our um, our rivers and creeks are spring fed. They're they're highly pristine at this point, and we've we've been doing a lot of research at at the Meadows Center. It's telling us that. Our streams and, and creeks are in really good condition for now. We have to keep them that way, but that includes um, preventing a lot of pollution from from entering those streams. The issue with wastewater hitting these hill country pristine, pristine streams is that a lot of them, a lot of the wastewater has high phosphorus levels. Still, it it may be clean and it may be um, okay to to enter into the system otherwise, but that's going to be feeding algae, which is going to choke out the system, cause, cause fish kills, um, and other, other issues that we don't even know a lot. And another issue is that, you know, there, the creeks are spring fed, but then there's also, um, recharge into the aquifer directly where our creeks are, are going back into the aquifer or popping up and, and down throughout the aquifer and, and up into the surface water again. We don't know a lot about that. So um, there's a lot more research that we need to do. We're, we're busy doing that right now. So, you know, these direct um, discharges could be going directly into the aquifer and then to, to someone's well around the corner. So we have to be really careful there. Cool. So, so coming back to uh, to Danny, um, you mentioned that uh, you've employed this technology. Um, so, so how, what have you learned so far about um, employing that technology? You have a ha customer? Oh, not yet, not yet. Okay. <laughs> so now our first customer is Orange County. We deliver next month. Uh, and, well, November, I should say. So not it's not October yet. Um, so we deliver in November, um, but we, you know. We do have customers. Uh, we're building systems, uh, but you know it's difficult. I mean, it's you know we're an early stage company. Um, we uh, it's new technology, as Tyler mentioned. You know, everyone wants to be second, so it's it's uh, you know 
thank God for uh, Orange County. Thank God for private sector industry. Uh, you know, the PFAS craze is is running industry to us. I mean, chemical companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies. So, um, I mean, so we've pivoted quite a bit from municipal. You know, our first our first customer is municipal. Um, our second customer should be municipal, but we've pivoted to industry just because uh, we think that's going to be a hotter market for us. So, uh, and it may help the municipal market, you know, down the road. So it's it's yeah, it's, it's new technology is tough with municipal. So, for the record, I didn't say no. <laughs> no, I, I understand. <laughs> hey, I've been doing this for three years. <laughs> Um, how is um, I'm curious about the energy consumption of the system. Oh, that's beautiful. Our our system, which is unique to our system. I mean, the technology supercritical water oxidation is a law of physics. So our system is our system air flow, and what we do, we use the caloric value of the waste of the sludge, et cetera, to power the system. So we convert the heat that the system generates into electricity. And our bigger systems, once we get up to our 30 uh, wet tons per day, actually generates net positive electricity. You know, so our, our smaller system uses, uh, I forget the amount off the top of my head, but a little bit of energy, a little bit of electricity. So net positive on the energy side, zero waste when we're talking about PFAS. I feel like investors would be running towards you. They were. They were. <laughs> what happened? He hit him with that hammer. <laughs> no, the, uh, because you just kept hearing for years about PFAS and the what was left over. It had to be trucked and incinerated. There's still something left, it buried in you know uh, in landfills. I think I, I think the market. Yeah, the market's waiting for us to deliver the system. I mean, uh, our our stock had a big run up when we. Uh, we got listed on the Russell 2000 or whatever, however that works. I'm not sure how that works, but uh, um, and it had a big run up, and then short sellers started shorting our stock. So anyway, our, our stock's stable right now. It's a good, it's a great buy, anybody. But but the point is, is uh, the point is, is that uh, yeah, I think once our system's delivered and commercial, I think it's a game changer. Well, the you know communities that are willing to you know, step forward and interact with, with new technology or, or gems. When I, when I work with the state, um, you know, quote unquote, innovative technologies, you know, like, like it wasn't enough for somebody in the state to do it first. It almost needed to be someone kind of local or in a region where, where other folks come in and kick the tires. And, and, and rather than talking to a government official, like, like I used to be, or, or, or the guy who invented and selling the technology to get to talk to an operator and get the real, you know, get the real story. And that's what uh, kind of in my experience, that's what really helps. And so it's like aquifer storage and recovery, taking water from one source, storing it in an aquifer and pulling out later. I mean, the technology has been around for decades. It really didn't take off in central Texas until San Antonio employed it. So, so, you know, me second, San Antonio did it first. Right. Um, and, and bless them for doing that because, you know, they had to deal with, figure out the permitting issues, figure out the uh, technology issues, the water quality issues. But once they did that, um, now there's in lots of communities looking at aquifer storage and recovery. And so, you know, so having communities do that first. I know, I know Dr. K works with you all, doesn't he, with uh, some wastewater treat, treatment streams to, to do things. I don't know if you're, not to put you on the spot, but I don't know if you're considering with the new wastewater plant, like maybe there is some lab space for um, you know, the engineering department at Texas State to uh, kind of interact and help test test things. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, uh, and, and I'm going to see him next Friday. We're doing a uh, treatment plant tour. I know Paul was going to uh, invite him over. Uh, so uh, hopefully he can he hopefully he can make that. Um, you but, give those to the public. Oh, the tour treatment plant tour. Absolutely. <laughs> the bus is full on this one. Uh, we, we, this one is uh, City Council and our Utility Advisory Board and stuff has been invited to this one. But uh, we 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 did. Would you like to come? Yes. That'd be great. Is that a yes? Okay. I'd like to go. We need, we need more of that. Yeah, come see us. Uh, we can do a water plant, a surface water plant too, as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, that's a full bust by itself, then, right? <laughs> uh, so, Danny, my question on it is: so, on your on, in your plant, though, what happens if your uh, supercritical system is down? Then, do you just make sludge, or does it impact your ability to process water? So, only thing we're processing, like for Orange County, is their sludge, right? So, we're we're one of many sludge elimination processes that they have. Um, you know, hopefully, eventually, someday. So only using us, but it's, you know, it's a true pilot system, six wet tons per day, which is nothing for them. I mean, I think they need 600, 600,000 wet tons, some, some, on, some big number, um, 600, but anyway, bottom line is if, if our system goes down, yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to, it, but there's a lot of redundancy built into the system. We're actually doing a water reuse project. In the, with the city of Houston, with a developer, and you know we're just building in redundancy into the system. So, I have a question too about I'm thinking Orange County. They can probably afford something like this for the the mid size and smaller size cities. When do you think that they will be be able to afford something like this in the future? Well, one of one of our you know, what I call secret sauces is we are mass producing. You know, the goal is to mass produce. We've, we've built two. We're building 10 right now as, as we speak. We're putting them in containers. So they're containers, you know, they're containerized. Will they make me cry? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> I'll cry in a good way. Um, no, so, so the idea is to drive the cost down by mass production, you know, so that's, that's our goal. That's, that our project originally was it, the, the technology came out of Duke University. It was funded by the Gates Foundation for the reinvent the toilet project. And the ideal of the project was to, you know, be able to give sanitation to the developing world. And so that's, that's where the technology came from. And, you know, we basically commercialized the technology. So. That's, that's what's cool about those challenges that get put out there, get people thinking creatively. And and, uh, and I don't know if they won the prize or not or were selected, but even if you don't, you know, there's there's all these offshoots of improvement that can happen. Well, we're, we're getting an innovation award at WebTech this, all right, this all right. weekend. Oh, neat, <laughs> neat. Would that potentially be an opportunity for the Texas Water Development Board, the innovation uh, team over there, it's... to work with these small to medium utilities on a technology like that? Um, certain, certainly possible. Yeah. They, they have, um, you know, they do have some, um, kind of research funds to play around with. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I think certainly a pitch can be, be made to them on that. Um, otherwise it requires a utility, you know, coming, coming to the board for funding or a grant to help employ something. Um, I know for, for the city of Wimberley, that cost savings in the sales pitch was so was huge. I think that sealed the deal. Oh. And I was speaking with the city of Blanco last night, who they're in, you know, tight position with limited resources, was rolling out this one water school of Wimberley just down the road. And one of the um, attendees was saying she worked for the, the school district. She's like, there's, there's no way we can afford something like that. It'd be great. But yeah, we're about to to build a school, I can't see that happening. When I said, when I told her about the almost million dollar savings over 30 years, she's like, okay, I can sell it. <laughs> and just the fact that, mm -hmm. that that's possible is is really amazing, especially with the, the energy produced or production too. Right. And something to remember too on, on some of this technology. So that on-site black water system I told you all about, that's expensive water. That's expensive to do. And 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 you know, it's a beautiful project, but I thought there's gonna be no one else that's interested in doing this. Well, there's a I'm not sure I'm allowed to say who it is, but there's a large university in Austin <laughs> that um was dealing with a situation where they're densifying, they have sewage pipes of a certain size. And so with their increased growth, they're going to have to dig up and increase the size of their sewage pipes. Well, guess what? They can do on-site black water reuse and, you know, grow and maintain those same sewage pipes. So in the bigger picture, the bigger envelope, 
they wind up saving a lot of money, even though the water generation itself is really expensive. So, um, so that's pretty cool. You know, the, the, again, that's something we just have to figure out, right? You, you're going to put your money in, in that black water system, or are you going to pay $10 a thousand for desal that you've got to pipe up from the coast? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's at some point, again, 35 years out, there's, there's a stop. Everybody's mm -hmm. got a stop sign right there, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody, yeah. nobody else gets to move in. And uh, so it, you got to figure that out somehow. So I also believe that with the growth of smart water technologies, you'll see um, the demand side change too. So you'll gain supply there just in, in behaviors. Like I turned my irrigation system off. There's more water now because I did that, right? So more and more people as they um, adopt these technologies, that's just another part of the, the supply portfolio. So, so Tyler, what are you doing on the smart water side of the ledger at San Marcos? So San Marcos put in um, uh, kind of crude uh, AMI system uh, back in 2008. We we're almost finished uh, with a uh, upgrade and replacement system for our AMI. So we have full AMI capability on all the electric meters in town and we're just over 90% complete on, on the water side. So, um, uh, you know, self-serving pitch here. Go to <laughs> sign up, go to your, you know, your customer connect utility billing website um, and sign up for the alerts. We don't um, just push our emails out to you. When we see that, you I need to come up. and sign up for that one uh, so that we're not um, offending those people who didn't expect it and don't yeah. want us looking at their data. Uh, but the data is coming in, um, and uh, we we have had that program now for a, a couple of years. And like I said, we're about 90 percent complete on our AMI. And and with that, um, you can set up your own individual triggers, right? You 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 know what's happening in your house. You can watch your bill. And if you're saying, you know, man, I'm 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 over 500 gallons a day. Something's going on, or 200, or what, whatever's unique for you. Uh, so that that's uh, you know a pretty important piece. So. Uh, yeah, we're excited. We've got our AMI, uh, you know, coming on. We also uh, do manhole monitoring. Of course, standard PM processes on both our water and wastewater system with camera technologies and smoke tests and those kinds of things. But uh, the interesting piece is to start putting uh, smart manholes and, and smart sensors out in the field and then bring that in and integrate it with your AMI uh, so that you have the you know, the capability then of starting to proactively look at that and saying, you know what, I don't need to wait until midnight for my metering to get updated. I can look at this now and say something's going on in this local vicinity. Now, short of putting pressure sensors or pressure switches and the telemetry on every meter out there, you don't have the advantage like you do with the electric meter. When the power goes off an electric meter, AMI system, the, the very last thing it does is called a last gasp, and it sends a uh, report back that says, I'm not reporting, but it's because I lost power, not because I failed, not because the communication system down. It's a positive contact that says I lost power. If you don't have that with pressure switches uh, in your meters yet, although we're looking at that for some key locations, uh, then you have to look at it. It, it. You're not looking at a single meter, single residence, single thing. You have to do it in a zone, but you can do that. And so that's what we're starting to, to put in now is where do we strategically place that technology out on the system and then you can look at that a little bit more collectively and even if it it you know maybe it only saves us two hours response time uh but that can be a hundred thousand gallons of water right. right so it's kind of one of those you know every hour we can get there and respond to a leak whether it's a main leak or or uh, you know other than and we just have to do that and then the the other piece uh you know michael you brought up is it, it's changing behaviors right I mean, uh, you, you got to know that, uh, you know, we need you guys all responding and, and, and get involved in that system and watch your meters. And, uh, you know, if there's a leak, we, we've got to take care of it. I heard that the city of New Braunfels is using remote sensing, too, to detect moisture and leaks that way. Have you heard of that or... Haven't, haven't seen that. You're talking about like at a, as a residential or commercial level? Out there really? um, yeah, citywide. Oh, very good. Kind of satellite imagery. Yeah. 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 I'll give Ryan a call and yeah. ask him about that. That'd, that'd be very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, Michael, we've, we've talked a little bit already about uh, me secondism. Um, mm -hmm. what, what other impediments are there in implementing kind of smart approaches 
to well, that's uh, a big water one. wastewater. Uh, that's certainly a big one. Uh, I, I mean, I think not being able to take enough risk and new technologies on the side of in, I mean, the municipal side, um, understanding of why, right? Uh, but not being in a position where there's incentive and rewards to do that, I think impedes the rollout. Um, you know, we've we we we've heard this many times. We we live and work in a risk averse uh, industry, but I think that will change over time um, with the rollout of, of stuff like this. Um, I also believe not working in this one water paradigm um, is an impediment to technology because you know we learned in grade school about the hydrolo hydrologic cycle. So why can't we manage it that way? And if we're managing it that way and we're connect, connecting data and connecting operators, um, we're gonna be more efficient, but not doing that um, certainly impedes the rollout. Um, and I also come back to workforce, right? We're not bringing in people fast enough that are interested in it. And if we're doing that, um, we're going to see more rollout of these kind of technologies. Um, I'd love to see more shared risk from the private side, utility side, uh, public sector agencies like uh, the Water Board and where I used to be up in Massachusetts at uh, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. We used public dollars to take early risk in companies and match those with wastewater and water utilities to demonstrate technologies with the hope that they would be accelerated into the market and adopted. Doing something like that um, is, is a great idea, but not doing it certainly slows uh, adoption. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll add one thing too, though, and, and, and this, of course, gets the, the smaller city you get, the smaller utility you get, the harder it is. AMI, nobody wants it. AMI doesn't pay for itself if you don't use it. If all you're doing is collecting meter data, <laughs> it's cheaper to have meter readers, clipboards, and, and crayons. It, it just is. <laughs> right? You have to be willing to start doing smart things. You have to be willing to start putting a system together um, or, or you've actually wasted your time and money. Now, you don't have as many dog bites, uh, but it doesn't pay for yourself if you're not going to be willing to take that step. Is AMI um, a standardized technology across utilities? Uh, do you, by that, do you mean does is everybody say using like it? Austin, or? Well, say like Austin Water and your utility, would they be using essentially the same kind of technology for this? Yeah, it's the same technology. It's it's some some version, and of course, there's multiple vendors out there, so each one has a little bit different twist to it. But at some point on a water meter, you you put a uh, a device on it that you actually, and it's got a battery in it, and one you know once a day or however much time you have it programmed, it just goes up. It's reading the entire time and just does a dump, mm -hmm. you know, either once a day or twice a day or whatever. Um, but yeah, basically you have that. And then the actual technology piece uh, isn't so much the sensor as is what infrastructure do you have to have to be able to have the communication network, the IT network behind that's where it I was leading. to extract that. To, and that's where it starts to change. Them, okay. right? So the hardware piece, you can pretty much just go swap those out and figure that piece out. Uh, but it's how you build your your network infrastructure that, that makes it a little bit. I think that's also another impediment to this, right? Okay. If you don't have standardized technologies and data sharing, it, it's not going to be efficient. Um, and so if we can um, improve there, I think we'll have more efficient um, adoption. I see also with the way these mid cities are set up with the rate structures. I, I remember in Waco and I'll use their phrase, Bless their hearts. When it would <laughs> when it would rain, the the COO would get so upset because he knew that we were not going to be making as much money that month. And <laughs> and it's true. I mean, there are a lot of these utilities dependent upon um, the rates of the customers, and so you know, pushing one water also involves the value of water and how we really need to start. Um, seeing it as more expensive, like being willing to pay more and and really revise the rate structures so that they can be motivated to to pursue these different new technologies. Yeah, I fully agree, 100%, the pricing structure, the value of water. Yeah. And, and there's a, you know, there's an opportunity in, in uh, for communities that are 
that have large universities in them to share data for research, you know, and how people use water. So some, something else to think about there. I, I uh, have a friend, uh, it's either Buter or Kyle, who was talking about their smart meter data during her, um, Hurricane Uri, during Winter Storm Uri, and uh, how, you know, how what was happening um, next door in the community next door was a, they could see the impacts on their water use, you know, when, when the water was starting to go down, they told people to start conserving or, or, you know, putting water in your tubs and stuff, you know, they suddenly saw a big jump in that use. So it's just kind of like a neat opportunity to see how people are responding um, to, to using water. Um, and then, uh, like I saw, uh, heard somebody speak about a study in um, Phoenix where, they could look at, like, you could look who got a permit to put a pool in. So you could look at their use before the pool went in. You could look at the use for those people after the pool went in and then see what the increase in water use was. And they were interested in, in seeing what the, you know, kind of the increased use of pool use was. But they also noticed there was a pretty substantial increase of indoor water use associated with having a pool. Hmm. Um, so, you know, there could be some kind of surprising thing. I don't know what you do with that information. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh this is kind of interesting. It's kind of understanding what's happening when there's there's changes. So that's that's pretty, uh, um, I think, pretty fascinating. Um, so so Jenna, on on the um, back back to kind of reuse. You know, how how can communities um, incorporate like reuse in the new development? We're seeing so much growth in Central Texas, um, and there's there's growth across the state and across the country. How how can this, a smarter way of looking at reuse be built into communities. I heard about a product called Hydroloop, where it's essentially a, a tiny wastewater treatment plant that you install. It's about the size of a like stackable washer dryer, and you hook it up to your your wastewater lines, including you know your shower, your your sink, your toilet. No, no wait, not your toilet. Um, and then it. And then it cycles through your house. You would not be using it for potable water, but you could use it for your laundry and flushing toilets. And so I'm waiting on a quote right now. I was kind of just typing in my own information, but um, I don't know how much it is. I would assume expensive, but that's that's one like in-home system you could use. And they do offer um, retrofit um, guidelines. You'd have to work with a plumber, obviously, but talking with developers and even realtors and, you know, these growing communities about outside the box ways that we can plan for the future is really important. So um, my friend over at Texas Water Trade, Charlene Florig is talking, um, kind of rebranding re it as um, net zero water for these developers and and talking about how it can be incorporated as we move forward. So repackaging, but those those types of systems are out there and becoming more popular and I think can be even a, a sales tactic for folks that are really concerned about moving to an area. But if they have this product um, already built in, it's going to be, it could be attractive. Hey, I just noticed that I'm the executive producer at White House Chronicle. That's awesome. Um, you can have the job. <laughs> yeah, have the job. Yeah. Does it pay well? <laughs> um, so, no, okay. Yeah, no, you can keep it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, before I open it up for questions from the audience, I, I want to ask the panel one, one last question and, and go down the line. We'll start with Danny and and head to the right. Um, but we have a saying here at Texas St State, uh, what's next? Um, and so so my question is, is uh, maybe twofold, sort of like what's next with what, what you're working on? And then also what's next in terms of uh, technology needs for the water and wastewater industry in your, your view? Basically for our company, what's next is deliver our first two systems, right? And that's, <laughs> yeah, that's coming yeah. up in the fourth quarter here how will we hear results of that you know uh, your website or well you're you'll be on my mailing list all right now, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Uh, every, everyone here will be on my list so 
no, it's, it's, it should be, you know, out in the trades, et cetera. Um, so, you know, hopefully that'll be our, our next step, our next big milestone. And then I, I think just like for us, you know, we, we have a saying inside of our company and I'll go back to this side of the hammer. All low, all roads lead to squo. And that's because if you, if you look at any, anything to do with waste, anything to do with water, anything to do with wastewater, uh, anything that's organic and, and needs, needs to get, we need to get rid of it instead of taking it to landfill instead of incinerating it or whatever. Um, so we will continue to look for applications. We have several DOD contracts, um, that are, materializing the dod i mean that's one area here in texas where we do have a, a big market big opportunity every every military base of our department of defense has polluted the ground around it with <laughs> with a triple f and you know so they're doing a lot of soil washing a lot of stuff to clean up the environment around these military bases and so we're we're focused on that i mean that's kind of more short term to long term, I mean that could take years to clean all these things up. But so, so it's just you know, uh, just different applications of our technology. Our our technology can clean up landfill. You know, landfill leachate. You know, landfill leachate is a big problem full of PFAS. Uh, we're working with a couple of companies on some landfill contracts. So it's a process, and hopefully it'll start be like running downhill eventually. But uh. All roads lead to Squo, so just remember that. All right, Michael, what's next? Sure. Um, well, we need a green button and an orange button. <laughs> um, I, I really love that. I'm, I mean, if that's out there, let me know. Um, it's going to be quite, it's going to be a lot harder in the, the water and wastewater utility space. I mean, we're talking about 150,000 water systems and 16, 17,000 wastewater systems. Um, but standardized data, uh, sharing that data um, and doing that within a one water context is now and next and next, um, really um, incentivizing risk taking on the municipal side because we don't necessarily have a technology problem per se. It's really just about um, adoption and implementation. And, and Andres, you talked yesterday about execution. Really having a good execution plan um, is very important. Um, so, you know, one water, shared data, higher connectivity with that data, that's now and next. Cool. Jenna, what's next? I I think the first thing that comes to mind is the next generation. They're tuning in, they're asking questions, they're holding us accountable for our our status quo practices. And, you know, through this extreme drought we've been in, there are more young people tuning in to seeing the green lawns and raising eyebrows and knowing that that was a, um, a choice. And we have our future, you know, children and grandchildren, you know, not just 50 years, but a hundred years down the road, what are they going to think about what we, what we were doing in this paradigm shift? So um, Meadow Center, we're a research center. We, we love, hearing about these new innovations and we want to follow that with research to help tell the story, um, provide case studies on how these innovators and trailblazers are, are doing it, what it costs, like what, what are the hindrances and then sharing that with, with others to inspire change and um, bettering for the future. And I'll just throw in that's such an excellent point that that, you know, research centers, you know, we we do interact a lot with the public. So we are a great vector for getting information out on technology and options, right. trying to make connections. So thank you for mentioning that. Tyler, what's next? Yeah, I think I'm going to tee off some of Jenna's comments. Um, some of what's next um, uh, behavior changes. You know, we've been talking about conservation for uh, actually, what, 150 years in the United <laughs> States, right? Um, how many gallons of water do you still use per day? So gallons of water per capita per day, GPCD, it's a, it's a, it's a measurement tool that everybody, um, and that is, you do have to turn that in with your 50-year projections, right? Not only is it 
50 year population, 50 year use then is based on what your anticipated GTCD is, uh, you know, um, based on your population. Uh, those numbers have to come down. And so it, how do you change that behavior? Uh, San Marcos, uh, two years ago, passed a new landscaping ordinance uh, that will uh, el eliminate, you know, your St. Augustine lawns, but it also only does it in new areas of town, which also gets back to what are these other technologies you have? How are you going to retrofit those, uh, you know, throughout the existing, you know, population? Um, so we have to figure that piece out, but we have to change behaviors. We have to get uh, gallons per day. Uh, pull down. Most of that is either through system losses or irrigation. And we said irrigation is great if it's uh, producing food products. If it's just water in your yard and it's just either running down the street or evaporating, that's the problem we have to solve. And we have to do that through education. We have to change how we build and how we look at things. Uh, so that that one's next. And and then uh, you know be, being that being accountable and and you know those folks come behind us. Uh, some of that's information. Um, and, and some of it's not, uh, right? Like I said, we've been talking about conservation for 150 years. It's not that we all don't know what that word means, right? You know, some problems we have is people don't understand. This is not one. They just don't care. They're just not active. We've got to change that behavior. Very good. And, and then you'd, you'd mentioned that, what, San Marcos hits the stop sign at 20 what 37 uh, or 20 no it's, 20, it's 50 from, from today i think it's 2064 2064 yeah so what, what do we do after that or is that like after your retirement you don't care <laughs> uh i've got five grandchildren so uh <laughs> yeah, yeah we do care uh, we do care yeah no that's that's the key right so uh whether that's uh, a direct potable uh you know one of these technologies is going to be the breakthrough that's the equivalent of uh, figuring out hydrogen on the electric side, right? I mean, we, we have to focus on that. We have to continue with the research. We have to perfect perfect those technologies. And it's, maybe it's not one technology, but uh, but we have to keep doing that so that we figure out a way. Again, there's only so many water molecules out there, right? And, you know, we say water is life. Water is life. Go to Tanzania and ask somebody, if I give you a choice, we're going to give you extra cops, We'll give you electricity and the internet, or we'll give you potable water. It's a slam dunk, right? You get tired of walking 12 miles one way every morning with two five-gallon buckets tied to a stick, right? Water's life, and then we've got to protect that. Very good. Yeah. Well, we'll open it up for questions, but I want to go ahead and thank the panel for uh, excellent um, participation and information. Um, Got, got time for a few questions. If anybody has questions for the panelists, Andres. Is time of use pricing uh, with the right infrastructure something to change that behavior? If it's being used? <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, uh, time of use pricing has proven to be a great tool on the electric side uh, and look for that from the city pretty soon. Now that we have our new gen. Uh, AMI in place, we need to get a couple of years data behind us so that we can put a rate structure in there uh, to make it attractive for folks to sign up for time of use, um, uh, but also not cause any harm to those who don't. Uh, so we're a couple years away from having a TOU program on the electric side. Water side is a little bit harder. Uh, not going to get too geeky here, but if you put if you have an equalization basin on the front end of your water, wastewater treatment plant, right, you have that buffer in there. So you're not quite as concerned about those peaks. Uh, by the same token, if you can buffer those peaks, then you don't have to do some of the other things on the back end of the plant that cost money and are part of the permitting process and stuff like that, too. So if we can shave those peaks off, it's always good. Uh, I don't know on the water side, it's a little bit harder. Like I said, you don't um, have that instantaneous data point. Uh, right. You can go to an electric meter and you can literally continuously stream that information. And that makes it a little bit easier. Water water's a little bit harder, but we are looking at it. Mm -hmm. okay, question back here. So we've got a technology flash coming. Because in the semiconductor industry, we're producing lines that are about the size the amount of your fingernail grows in three seconds. And in order to do that, we need your e bus. We have not come up with a substitute yet. We tried a few things, and 
this makes it extremely difficult because we can't produce what we're producing if you take the people off the way from us. And as an industry, and I'm on the roadmap committee, we're trying to look at ways to remediate it, but we're also looking at exceptions from the government in order to keep the production. Going. So that, that's a, you know. So, so this is a CO2 equivalent problem. It's, you know, it's, it's, harmful, it's harmful to us, but we need it for industry. Right. However, yeah. however, there is technology that eliminates it. And we're working with semiconductor companies. I mean, that's part of the industry that came running to us with the PFOS grade. So. Because we had no substitute. Yeah. You know, we've tried everything. Right. And there's a couple of things they have tried. Look promising, but when you try and get it to scale, it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. So for the folks online, the, the comment was, was PFAS is needed in the semiconductor industry. And so and there's no substitute at this point. So yes, yes. that's Andres. Yes, that, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Any other? Yeah, we just remove it from products um, that are widely used and only direct them to the semiconductor industry. And then I'm thinking about the life cycle of the semiconductor. And then what happens after that? The other problem we have because of the size as we go further into nano and then into metamaterials i need more of it yeah <laughs> okay yeah. not less i need more and by the way i use a lot of water that's true making these products ultra, ultra pure water, water. yeah mm -hmm. so you know we're it's we're catch 22. how do we do this and still meet the requirements you know and the industry is aware of it we're just working on it we just don't have answers yet. Yeah. yeah, and as a mother, I, I'd say, like Michael, if there are options for consumables or, you know, things that are not in the semiconductor industry, but are still using P PFAS, I want to know, and and I, I, I want options that are, I'm, I'll pay more to not have it. Right. Yeah, and the, the comment for the folks online was, uh, I guess, as the technology, semiconductors get small, they need more PFAS. Um, and they also need a lot of water, which is a whole other topic uh, oh, yeah. that's affecting yeah. Central Texas uh, right. groundwater supplies. Um, here we go. We got one we have a question over here. My neophyte viewers in IRP looking for a rate increase for water infrastructure investments is harder. Is that be right? Then it is better. Can you repeat the question? That'd be cool. Sorry. Can you repeat the question? Price of water goes up all the time. It's here than it is. it easier to raise prices for water compared to electricity or more to <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, San Marcos, um, I didn't check the numbers in August, but typically San Marcos uh, CISD reports uh, their enrollment at the beginning of every year, and it's usually 70, 73, 75% at or below poverty level. Politics and, and social constraints are we cannot just raise rates to take care of this plan. You're, you're not going to get votes. Uh, now, fortunately, electric, uh, shame, shameless plug here again, we are the lowest residential and commercial rates in four counties in any direction. Uh, we are going to have a 5% base rate increase, 2% effective in October. Um, the first time uh, we had a vote on that three weeks ago, it went down three to four. But the lowest provider, again, four counties, any direction, residential and commercial, it got voted down. Uh, we we corrected that and it did pass. It only passed four to three. Uh, so if you're asking me, neither one is easy. Uh, and I don't like raising rates uh, at all. Uh, but uh, some of these solutions cost money, right? And it's not just the risk averse. It's it's where do I get the money to go make that investment? Right? If 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 you if it was a hundred percent slam dunk uh, project, I still got to pay for it, right? And from a technology standpoint, and so it's it's a twofold problem for us. So for the folks online, the question was: Is it easier to um, raise rates for water than it is for electricity? And, and Tyler said no. Um, one quick question. The last question. I, I just had, <clears throat> I was wondering, I mean, I work for a utility and I was just kind of running things through my head. You know, in my experience, 
in talking to people about water, it, it's, it's a very nebulous situation for a lot of them. Because, okay, what should you be using versus what you are using? So from an education standpoint, do we have anything that, because I don't see a lot of it, that, that teaches people that, okay, if there are two people in your household or if there's four people in your household, you should be using about X amount of water. Then you have X amount of permeable space, your yard, or whatever you have, so that they can, is there any kind of programs in place at JLC that teach people that, okay, here, here's your target. Because, you know, when we say people don't care, I don't, I don't really think it's that they don't care, it's that they don't know. You know, if I'm ignorant about something, I just don't, I don't look at it, you know. There's no target for me to hit. And the only, the only target that, that they see, typically, is, is when they get that bill at the end of the month. Or if you have an AMI system, you may get a notice. But even if you get a notice of a leak, that doesn't mean that what you're, what you're normally using is good, you know. Um, so, so you mentioned 50 gallons a day per person. Well, that was like loss at the street. But like, like in my house, it's we're, we're 25 to 30 gallons per person per day. That's pretty low. We don't, and that's year round. So we don't do any city water outside. Yeah, you know, there's, there's, there, there, there are some. Uh, the question is for the folks online: Is is there any education tools like how much water people should be using? Um, that's, that's a great question. You know, there, I know there's some utilities in uh, California that each household has its own billing structure based on the number of people living in the house and the amount of turf they have. And so, so, you know, you have an ideal amount that you pay. And as soon as you exceed that amount, the presumption is you're not being conservative with your water use and you go to a higher tier rate. Um, there's certainly ways to do that. Um, there's a, uh, there's some data that uh, Ricardo and I have put together um, looking at rainwater harvesting and like how much, you know, what's the range of use that people use? I'm I'm signed up to a program in Austin that every month I get a um, a text that tells me, you know, what my water usage is and how I compare to my peers. Um, and and there's there's uh, research out there that shows that that people respond to how they compare to others. And so if it looks like they're out of whack with others. And they're more likely to do to do more. Now, it's interesting about this algorithm. It's like my wife and I use less than two thousand gallons a month, and it'll say that my peers are using less water. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, with all these with all these green lawns around me. So I think the algorithm. Yeah, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute here. But um, so there's so there you know, and, and the AMI can kind of help with that too. Like you could take that data, maybe look at similar type households and come up with a number to kind of compare. Now, what people should be using, you know, there's a, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, newer homes have lower indoor use because all the um, utility, the um, appliances and the faucets have to meet federal and state standards. Um, so at time, you know, we do see kind of a, it's called passive conservation. Nobody has to do anything. Um, so, so, so it's certainly possible, but but I'm not aware of like a tool that tells you that right now. There are some online calculators. You could take a look at waterfootprint.org. Maybe it's .com. I think it's .org. Um, you can start plugging in some some like your family size. You could also look at uh, how water is used across other sectors and for other products. Um, it would be one way. Um, and then kind of do a comparative with how other countries use water. Um, 20 to 30 in this country is extremely low. Um, it's probably north of 100 gallons per day per person. Um, it might even be north of 200. I mean, the developed world uses a lot more water, more than we should be using on a daily basis per capita. But um, yeah, you could check out waterfootprint.org. And then be careful on GPCDs, gallons per capita daily. They're calculated in different ways. So like the state state yeah. goal is 140, but that's like taking the use of San Marcos and dividing it, total use of San Marcos and divided by the population. There's residential GPCD. So I think like in Texas, I think a residential GPCD is down around 80, 85 gallons per person per day. Um, and that's, uh, and about a third of that is outdoor use. Um, and then um, um, Ricardo and I can hook you up. We did a look like there's some interesting goals that California has and Los Angeles have and Denver, Colorado has for, for what they think is the ideal residential um, per capita usage. So we'll have to cut it off there. Fascinating questions, discussion. Another round of applause for the panelists. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you.